Good morning. I hope you had a good night rest. Yesterday we had a busy day and today also we have a long day ahead of us. Mr. Krish Gopalakrishnan is not well, so he has requested me to chair this session. The session is about scaling inclusive innovation, challenges and perspectives. We have about seven speakers, very distinguished panel. I want to welcome all our panel members. I want to thank them for being here and giving their valuable time and input. Scaling innovation, especially inclusive innovation, is a big challenge. We find this in India that a lot of good ideas remain in pilot phase. At times I tell our colleagues that we are a country of a pilots. Too many pilots going on everywhere and not enough of these pilots scale. Scaling requires different culture. Prototyping, pilot, you can jerry-rig something, make it work, but when you really have to scale, you need to bring different set of skills, whether it has to do with design, market, business development, costing, pricing, all of that is equally critical to inclusive innovations. I know of at least five ideas in India that we need to scale and we have not been able to scale for all kinds of reasons. So recently, Government of India decided to set up a special fund just to scale ideas. A venture fund is normally set up to feed into ideas and building a company, but we decided to set up a separate fund where idea that has already been piloted, prototyped, and needs funding to scale we give them different skill sets along with that funding. So I'm very excited about this session. I look forward to learning from our distinguished speakers. And with this background, I would like to request our first speaker, Mr. Richard Burton, Minister of Jobs, Enterprise and Innovations from Ireland. Thank you, sir. Thank you very much indeed. Um, first of all, I'd like to say how pleased I am to, to be here to address your conference. Uh, I first visited India 35 years ago, uh, and it is certainly a dramatically changed uh, country in, tho in those years. Uh, and in many ways, Ireland has had to travel a similar journey. We, s we started before we joined the European Union as uh, an agrarian economy, largely dependent on agriculture, with huge um, emigration, huge outflow of young uh, people from Ireland each year. We had a high, high birth rate, but many people were emigrating. And the challenge, I suppose, for Ireland was to develop uh, an enterprise sector that could support employment at home. Uh, our model, I suppose, after we joined the EU was very much to uh, be open to particularly foreign direct investment. And I suppose foreign direct investment for Ireland played a very significant role in our capacity to, to build a strong indigenous or Irish owned uh, enterprise sector. The foreign investors were, I suppose, the tall oaks in the forest of enterprise uh, in Ireland. And they came initially uh, because the government provided a very business-friendly environment in terms of cost, in terms of tax, in terms of ease of doing business, uh, and certainty. I think the challenge then for Ireland was to build under those, if you like, tall oaks of the forest. How do you build a forest floor that is equally vibrant and creates enterprises that can grow and thrive? And I suppose the government approach in Ireland has been quite government-driven uh, dr in many ways. Uh, government has played a very active part in, in the Irish development story. 
starting with a very large-scale investment by government compared to other European countries. The scale of investment in Ireland has always been much higher in infrastructure, but also in education. And our investment in education, I suppose, has been a critical feature in, in the Irish development story and seeking to spread uh, the capacity to build strong enterprises through uh, less advantaged communities. We've also been very active in that there has been a very strong enterprise strategy uh, developed by government, not an industrial sectoral strategy like about steel or, or the big industrial sectors, but rather about creating uh, a seedbed where enterprise could grow. We have adopted an approach of having strong uh, enterprise agencies, which are single-purpose agencies, um, in tourism, in uh, enterprise, in food, in different uh, sectors. And these have been independent of political uh, influence. So they have been independent in their, manda in their uh, mandate. Uh, they've had boards that are independent of their political uh, masters. So the ministers are responsible for policy direction, but execution is through an agency that's outside the political network. So when it has come to the development of, of uh, sustainable enterprises from the bottom up, uh, I think we have been one of the most adventurous in, in European terms in uh, creating a, an agency that would take seed uh, capital uh, participation in new enterprise. Uh, so we have sought to develop uh, access to seed capital. We have sought to build uh, incubator uh, units within our universities. Uh, we have developed microfinance as, as a, a, a tool. Uh, so we have also developed mentoring as a, a, an accompaniment, and these are delivered at local level uh, in our various municipal municipalities. So I think that has been a, a strong feature of the Irish model so that there is a, a, a lot of support in getting access to finance and steering uh, emerging businesses through what they might call the valley of death when a lot of uh, emerging ideas uh, perish. Ireland hasn't done everything right over its, uh, its period of development. We've had a number of very significant reversals, um, both in the... In the uh, 80s and again uh, a property bubble in, in the noughties in the last number of years. I think a key feature for Irish success is having a coherent strategy from government that seeks to uh, bring every department of government into the central challenge which for us is jobs. We see jobs and job creation as the central way in which you address social exclusion. Uh, and we have sought through um, a mechanism right across government to engage every single agency, every single department in the challenge of job creation. So in education, for example, they would be looking very explicitly at what skills do we need to develop to match our ambitions to build clusters in the areas where we have competitive strength. Such areas for us are not dissimilar from, from India, ICT, medical devices, uh, pharmaceuticals, financial services. There, there are a lot of sectors where we've built uh, you know, domain strength. We've sought education to, to develop that. We've also sought, for example, to use our health system to become a test bed for emerging new businesses so that new business ideas can get tested in an Irish setting and then have the capacity with that reference to go global to go, to, to go international in, in, their, in their scaling. We've also been very open to the participation of industry partners in the development and execution of strategy for employment. So we have a number of individuals who, I suppose, support government in the implementation of strategy. I think bringing uh, private sector participants in to help shape policy gives it's like a catalyst to ambition and to change for those working within the public service. Uh, I think for us it has been a, a source of dynamism to create uh, the impetus to, to deal with what has been a huge crisis in, re in recent years. Uh, so I think that's a very short uh, account of how Ireland has approached this challenge. Uh, 
I think there is no doubt that new technologies are very much democratizing business startup. It's made, making it much easier to start enterprises. Uh, and I think the challenge is to ensure that those who do start uh, can succeed. And we have to, you, you have to create a business environment uh, that allows such uh, small emerging companies to, to succeed. So it's, it's right across the spectrum, from seed capital, from mentoring, to uh, supporting the community, to, to give opportunities for local products to be purchased, uh, right through to, to, to developing that, that company inter international scaling. We have we are a very small and open economy. So for us, coming out to countries like India to showcase what our enterprises can do is a very important part of our growth story to, to, to build on not just the domestic market, but we have to scale. If we want to scale, we have to scale globally. We cannot scale at home. Uh, and that has been an additional hurdle that small enterprise has to cross. And again, our State agencies play a very active role with locations right across the globe, supporting those companies to, to seek to, to open up new markets uh, away from home. Uh, so I think I'll leave it at that. I know there's a lot of speakers, uh, and I'm sure there's a lot of uh, different perspectives to be offered. Thank you very much. Thank you very much. As you know, we'll have some time for discussions later. So I request all our speakers to be brief and follow the schedule as much as they can. Our next speaker is Dr. Ricardo Sosa. He's from Singapore. Um, yeah, well, thank you, first of all, the acknowledgments for, uh, uh, to the organizers of the conference. Yes, thank you. Um, I'm not from Singapore, but I come representing Singapore. I'm from Mexico. Um, I'm a product designer, industrial designer, um, I guess, I'm happy to bring some diversity. Um, I'm, this is not the usual sort of community that I, that I talk to, but I'm, I'm very happy and excited, and it's been a huge learning uh, opportunity for me as well. So I have only one message in, in my presentation. I hope I can, I can get to it very quickly, and uh, there is only one key message. But uh, just to give a, a bit of context, I come from a very hands-on background, uh, being, uh, growing up in Mexico. I built my first car when I was 18. Uh, my family, uh, people in my family have set up businesses and consultancies and even a university. So I grew up with this idea in Mexico that things are not given to you. You have to create them uh, pretty much to, to get ahead. So I'm going to talk um, about Opportunity Lab. Opportunity Lab is, I like to call it a, gross, a grassroots uh, lab, which is something that you can do in a uni university uh, like SUTD in Singapore. This is a university with only um, two years. So we only have two batches of students. And in this process, uh, researchers, faculty, and students, uh, we started to talk to each other last year, uh, and we realized that we had a lot in common. And one of those things was that we wanted to design things for, for the majority of people uh, who are currently outside the design spectrum and the design vision. So we came up with this um, initiative. We were backed by Professor uh, uh, Kim Vandiver, and uh, Professor Chris Wood here, and a lot of people in SUTD thought that this was a good idea. So we are at the moment uh, running programs in the Philippines and in India, uh, in my group. Other groups in OLAB are running projects in Myanmar, uh, Vietnam, uh, Malaysia, Indonesia, and recently there is a new initiative with partners in Fiji as well. So we are a, a university lab. Um, our approach is human-centered. Uh, this is, of course, not a new um, initiative, uh, type of initiative. There are lots of university groups doing this. But our, our difference is that we are not technology driven. We don't seek to bring solutions from outside. Uh, we want to facilitate change by growing these partnerships with, with our uh, colleagues and to uh, build new ideas together. So we are interested in this uh, creative exchange. Uh, we come from different backgrounds, not only culturally, but also uh, disciplinary. So uh, there are five founding members in our lab, a uh, sociologist, uh, an architect, an engineer, an urban planner, and myself. So we bring very different um, viewpoints to, to, the, to the approach. 
And one of our aims as well, being from a university, is uh, to research what's happening in this, in this area. And particularly at the moment, we're looking at partnerships and how we grow partnerships. So we're, I'm going to talk about um, how we need to change. Uh, I'm borrowing this phrase from, from Einstein, uh, who said we cannot solve the, the problems with the same thinking. I'm changing thinking for disciplines. Uh, so we are aiming to build new disciplines in SUTD. And we aim to use that in OLAB to generate a different type of, of ideas. I, I have background on this. I did my first um, design project with indigenous communities in rural areas in Mexico uh, almost 20 years ago. And I should stress that we're not so much interested in, in, in solving problems. Uh, that's not our main, main approach. Our main approach is to help communities frame their own problems to help them reflect, uh, help them build capacity and leverage on existing practices and learning from each other and empower change agents. Um, we believe that SUTD is the right place to do this because SUTD has a mandate to be different and to be new. So we think this is a great place to do that. And very concretely, so this is the background. Very concretely, we are working on a project with these uh, three Indian institutions. Uh, one is Sri, Sri Chitra Institute of Medical Science and Technology, uh, IIT Madras, and uh, uh, Christian Medical College of Belor. Uh, they have an, an MTech program on clinical engineering, and we talked to them last year, and this year we brought our first uh, batch of students to work with them from OLAB. And um, since these are very early stages, uh, students were here only two months ago, there is still an, an ongoing process of ideation and, 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 uh, and, and framing the, the project. So instead of showing up some preliminary results, what I want to do is I want to, to point one single aspect that I think would make these type of programs scalable and have a bigger impact. And that single aspect is creativity. We see creativity as sort of a human right and something that everyone has access to and potential. That's our key premise. And we frame this not, not from individual creativity necessarily, but from a team and, and from a cross-disciplinary, cross-cultural team. Um, and so we believe that every community has a potential for game-changing uh, solutions. Now, the problem and, and sort of my main message here is that the current systems seem to be doing everything to prevent creativity. And when I say this, people ask me, can we teach creativity? And, and I think that's the wrong question. I think if, if someone asks that question, um, it's, it's, not the, it's not going to lead to very insightful uh, directions. I think the main issue is that we need to stop preventing it from happening. And this applies to the education system, of course. So yesterday when we saw Startup Village and what they do, um, amongst other examples, I think that um, in general, our students in Singapore and the students we've interacted with in, in India, they are brilliant students. They, they've, um, they've excelled in the current system. And because of that, I think they, are, they find it extremely difficult to, to be creative. So um, even if, if, if they are given these platforms like this type of courses, this type of programs, they find it really different, difficult to, to let go. Um, there are changes that are needed at the society level, of course, families, organizations, institutions, cultural uh, uh, issues, policies. And the current trends are certainly not, not encouraging. So IP protection with the TPP and consumer mindset, uh, surveillance, um, even the accreditation of new programs, the KPIs, and all the rituals, all these are stifling uh, creativity. So instead of asking if we can teach it, I think we should ask it, how can we enable it and how can we let it grow in each of our um, domains and institutions? So just as a, more as a conversation and a reflection thing than any conclusion, we don't, we don't present this to conclude anything in particular, but we're calling this a creativity awareness index. And this is an exercise, a thinking exercise. And what we do here is we present, it's a relative measure. I don't know that you can see the numbers, but this table, what it shows is five, um, is, is a result of searching the uh, five government domains in, in five different countries and five universities in the same countries for the word creativity. So we're interested to measure how, or to characterize how these websites address creativity. And because we cannot compare 
apples and oranges. We don't know the internet size of the countries. So we compare it to other topics that they might be talking about, like mathematics and technology. And again, this is not any conclusion, but we are showing that in some countries, including India, for instance, creativity is not so much in the, in the discourse or in the, in the agenda. Um, so the awareness is, is somehow low. And this seems to correlate nicely with the universities, and these are technology universities in these, in these places. So to conclude, um, I think in the future we need to expose, form cross-disciplinary teams, expose them to creativity and design, more hands-on reflective thinking. Um, the future decision makers, I, I think that besides the technical knowledge that we train them with, we, we need to train them with uh, creativity and design. And this is not to adopt existing models like design thinking or hackathon or maker or fab lab, but I think every project, every community needs to develop their own um, uh, solutions in participatory ways and to come to these important forums to share their experiences. <coughs> Thank you very much. Thank you. Our next speaker. <laughs> Thank you. Our next speaker is Dr. Rosenthal from Netherlands. Thank you, Mr. Petora. Um, let me uh, indeed try to scale up, and uh, let me just jump immediately towards uh, what we call an inspiring example of scaling up. And actually, this is called Rural Spark. It is as yet a, um, a tiny company. It was established not so long ago by three young Dutch graduates. <coughs> and this company develops smart grids for the 400 million people in rural air India that do not have access to electricity. All those people who depend on kerosene and, uh, for lighting and firewood for cooking. Now Rural Spark facilitates local small-scale energy networks in such villages. And the villagers can rent equipment, for instance solar panels, and they will then become local energy suppliers and they distribute electricity and thus earn money. Such small scale, scale energy suppliers link up to each other in indeed quickly expanding networks. So that is scaling up. And each producer rents a router to connect to the network. In this way, they can trade their surpluses among each other. And uh, such networks are to be considered living laboratories. They are continuously improving on the basis of shared experiences. And new tools are gradually being added to improve lighting, charge batteries, and uh, store energy. These grids are not, let me emphasize, high tech. Rather, they are a wonderful example of organizational innovation. That is what it is all about. And Rural Spark has recently teamed up with the French multinational, GDF Suez, to scale up their innovation. Now, this is an example of scaling up. And upscaling inclusive innovations like these is extremely challenging. I don't need to tell you that. And in some cases, it depends on the available infrastructure. You will have no mobile phones without satellites. You will have no sewage treatment without sewers. Private inter initiative is capable of providing new phones and sewage treatment plants but providing the satellites and uh, sewers often demands effective coordination, I should stress it, and considerable investments. In other cases, the upscaling of innovation depends on the possibilities for market creation. Innovations aiming at the bottom of the pyramid here in India must be low cost. So it's all about economies of scale. And that is to say mass products, broad market access, and large-scale distribution systems. And here, too, it's all about, I would say, organization, coordination, and of course, and I, I stress the adjective, sound financing. For that matter, upscaling innovations necessitates, necessitates the involvement of new stakeholders. And sometimes it is a multinational that takes innovation to the next level. For instance, single service, single serve, Packaging for products like shampoo, ketchup, detergents is, a, is one of the well-known classical examples. It takes a big company like the multinational Unilever 
to de develop the scale and distribution systems to make such innovations indeed profitable. In other cases, you need the involvement of NGOs with indeed local knowledge and you need local partners. They will be the way forward. And we may also direct our efforts at partnerships, there we go again after yesterday's uh, sessions, partnerships with research institutes or government agencies. And in the Netherlands, we believe that bringing these stakeholders together at a very early stage considerably strengthens the innovation process and the scaling up process. Now, as I have said yesterday, the Dutch government has identified nine key industries. I don't need to elaborate on that again. Uh, they are called top sectors, and each of them has established what we call top consortia for knowledge and innovation. They are working on specific R&D topics, and in these consortia businesses cooperate with universities, research institutes, and government. Together they organize and finance relevant projects. Now I give you two examples, one of the, from the energy side and one from the water technology and management side. With regard to energy, we have seven top consortia in the energy field, and they deal with projects on very concrete pro uh, topics, such as solar, wind, and biological uh, energy sources, on energy savings in buildings and in industry, on natural gas, and there we go again, smart grids. And each of these consortia is, des is des designed in a way as a platform. As new technologies are being developed, both private and public interests are taken into account, and I should stress that, from the really very beginning of the process, from the very onset, the availability of markets and infrastructure, financing and upscaling play a significant role. That's about energy. Now about water. Of course, that's a huge uh, issue, not only in India, but also in the Netherlands. Let me say that I'm living six meters below sea level in the Rotterdam area in the Netherlands. So we know something about water management, I would say. I hope at least we do. And um, here in, in India, you have, in 2030, as far as we know, eight, 68 cities with populations over 1 million. Delhi will have uh, estimated guess 26 million, Mumbai 33. And all these people will need clean water, treatment of sewage, and many of them protection against floods and rising sea levels. And meeting such needs, on this enormous scale poses unprecedented challenges. The Dutch water industry has three strong consortia, and they deal with coastal protection, with maritime technology, and thirdly, water treatment. And much of the relevant research is done in collaboration with distinguished foreign partners, not the least partners in India. Water is one of the main themes on the agenda of the India-Netherlands Joint Committee on Science, Technology and Innovation. And through the Joint Committee, the Indian Department of Science and Technology and the Netherlands Research Council fund collaborative research on se selected themes. And this is going back already to, for more than 30 years. So we have get, got accustomed to each other as well. And regarding R&D in water technology and management, a memorandum of understanding, a MOU, has been signed this year. Recently, to be as concrete as possible, the Dutch Indian Water Alliance for Leadership Initiative, called according to um, the uh, well-known Indian tradition Diwali, has been established. And in a way, Diwali is like the Dutch top consortia. I don't need to elaborate on that. It is meant to develop sustainable solutions for water challenges in India through public-private partnerships. And Diwali addresses low-cost, low-cost water purification, water safety, water reuse, desalination, water resource management, water storage, etc. It's all about the needs of the people at the bottom of the pyramid. And in addition, it focuses on capacity building and business development. A very exciting example of Indian-Dutch cooperation delivers in-water R&D, 
delivers inclusive innovation, to deliver inclusive innovations, is what we call the new urban sanitation system. It's a new novel, a new system that converts wastewater into water for industrial processes, and not the least, irrigation. And it combines two in innovative technologies developed by Dutch companies. They have developed a new electrochemical sewage treatment process, as well as a new technology um, to ferment sludge and produce biogas. Putting these unique innovations together will produce a revolutionary system for the decentralized, decentralized treatment of um, waste water. And the biogas produced will be about twice what is needed to fuel the system. And nutrients can be extracted again from the sludge to be used as fertilizers in agriculture. So it, it runs well. Currently, 75% of Indian wastewater is released without any sort of treatment. As cities in India are growing very rapidly, such systems are, of course, in very great demand. This new urban sanitation system will now be adapted to Indian conditions by a consortium of these Dutch enterprises, Indian corporations, and municipal authorities. And the Indian enterprises have an excellent, really excellent track record in waste processing and in infrastructure development. <coughs> the state of Gujarat has shown in, uh, great interest in it. And next year, the consortium will build a pilot plant there. And then, there you go, Mr. Petroda, scale up, scale up. And the business case is indeed about the demand of several hundreds of these systems. Our Indian partners, let me emphasize that, will be serving the Indian market. Now, such broadly based consortia combine valuable Dutch and Indian knowledge and expertise. They are highly promising vehicles for developing innovative practices and for scaling up. To conclude, platforms like Diwali actively bring Indian and Dutch businesses together they foster inclusive innovation and take upscaling into account from, I stress it again, the very early stage onwards. And the development of this new urban sanitation system in Gujarat could be, could be called a fine illustration. And by now we know it works, so we would say let's do it. Thank you. Thank you. Our next speaker is Mr. Anil Sinha. He is a regional head, advisory services for International Finance Corporation in India. Uh, thank you, Mr. Sam Petroda. Um, thank you for inviting me here uh, at this very distinguished uh, gathering. Great pleasure for me to be here on behalf of IFC, the International Finance Corporation, which is the private sector arm of the World Bank. We share a common objective which is poverty alleviation and increasing shared prosperity across the World Bank group. But our focus is through private sector development. We are a self-sustaining financial institution. We raise money from the market. We invest in the developing world. Last year, we committed $20 billion to the private sector without government guarantees. And we also have, as an adjunct to investment, a strong advisory program, about $400 billion worth, uh, where it provides advice to companies, to governments as well as, as sub-PPPs. Inclusive business is a special focus for us. We have a special group working on this, which I represent. Till date, we've invested $10 billion in inclusive businesses across 85 countries. In addition to our own direct work, we also represent the G20, and we run the G20 competition for inclusive businesses to unearth what's happening internationally and share best practices and case studies. In India, we, along with the World Bank, we run the development marketplace competition, which I designed in, uh, and, and implemented. Operation Asha, which you heard yesterday, is a good example of that, and you heard uh, Ono, uh, my colleague at the bank, speak about that. So what are the examples of, of, of this in India? One aspect is the large companies driving down, the corporates driving down to the base of the economic pyramid, and the other is the smaller companies starting up. Both have different challenges, and this topic is about scaling. Scaling can be there for both. I'll give you an example of a financial inclusion project, because we've heard of some of the others uh, in the social sector. A company called Fino 
was trying to provide financial services to the base of the economic pyramid in the Arabi slums. We provided that finance and we provided them three years or four years of, of support to get the business model right. They're now accepted as a correspondent banking model by the RBI. They link financial institutions online to the slum dwellers and the uneducated at the base of the economic pyramid. It took them three and a half years to reach a million customers. Now they reach a million customers every month themselves. They have 60 million customers. India offers a scale for experimentation uh, along with technology, and this uses a very fancy US biometric card system which has a voiceover, so the poor can activate their account even in a pawn shop or at a railway station, and in the local vernacular can get a readout of what their account is. They charge 1% to the financial institutions, nothing for the beneficiaries, they're making money out of it. The government of India is using Fino to deliver Enrega, which as you know is one of the world's largest unemployment guarantee schemes in the world. So the use of the private sector model to deliver services that the government wants to deliver and deliver it more effectively is an interesting development paradigm in its own right. I could give you examples of companies like Huspower, rural off-grid solutions which are providing off-grid electricity to the, to the rural Bihar, for example. Um, in addition to the work that we do ourselves, we also work with these companies directly so that we also learn thereafter. We also are funding funds. So we funded Avishkar, which is one of the big rural funds in India, as you know, um, perhaps one of the most successful ones. And interestingly, we just funded Infuse. Infuse is a new fund that links to the IM Ahmedabad incubators. So as the companies graduate out of the incubators, they can, uh, they, they can avail of financing. But I'd just like to share with you our experiences of scaling. I'd like to divide my comments, and, and for brevity, I'm not going to use the formal pre presentation, but I'll, I'll just talk about two aspects, financial services and non-financial services that the companies need. Financial services, I think we heard a very interesting presentation from the Israeli representative about the graduating principles. As company graduates, they need financing of different kind at different levels. What is missing, therefore, in India right now is the early stage risk capital. And I'm, I'm glad that, 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 that the NIC is putting up this fund because there's a need for that. The other need is, is for debt. When companies graduate, they're looking for working capital, they've pledged all their security to the banks, they don't know how to get the next round of financing. And I would look at debt as another instrument. But then the other aspect is the appropriateness of debt, which is how do you exit? A fund provides debt, how do you exit from that? Because many of these companies are not going to list, at least not initially, how do you exit? And how do you get the mechanism working? One is to look at a quasi-debt instrument, where a company can buy back the equity through performance. Uh, the, uh, the IFC is out of a grassroots business fund, which is operating internationally, which is looking at this, and they're doing this in India. It's an interesting play. Even the more established funds have not exited in any meaningful manner. There have been at least only about half a dozen really exits from even the big funds right now. I think one space to look at as we develop this so-called ecosystem is look at exit mechanisms for the fund so that more money can come in and I can drill down on that and some ideas we have on that space. Non-financial services. And I firmly believe that it is easier to turn a businessman into a social entrepreneur then it is to turn a social entrepreneur into a businessman. And if you want scale, and if you want that company to really expand, they need to develop the business aspects of that. So I think the non-financial services support, what we've had examples of, say, Huspower, if it wants to set up a franchise model and go to 150 villages in Bihar from 30, they need MI systems. They need tools and techniques they need HR systems. When do you put an HR system? When you've got a five-company, uh, five-person uh, company, you don't need that. When do you need to professionalize? And I think there's a big space in that that needs to be uh, developed further. And also, scaling is not for everybody. Many of the development institutions want scale so quickly. We've seen many poster childs of development fail because of too much being asked of the entrepreneur too quickly. So patience, patient capital, and, and patient support 
is another aspect that, that, that we've, we've encountered. And, and lastly, just to close, we, we talked about policy regulatory issues and we spoke about failure. Failure certainly is the other coin, other side of the coin to, to innovation. And I think in terms of what we call uh, the, the, the regime for, for uh, closing down companies, um, the, it's, it's called the insolvency regime can be looked at much more than it is now. The World Bank Group publishes the Doing Business Report, and India does very poorly in terms of insolvency. And I think uh, we need to look at that much more to encourage innovation. On that, I'd like to close now, and I'd be happy to discuss further. Thank you. Our next speaker is Mr. Narula, Raj Narula. He's a president and co-founder of Taraspan. Uh, thank you, Mr. Speaker, and uh, esteemed guests, good morning, uh, and panelists. Um, you know, as a, as a Canadian private company, I'm here to share uh, a lot of our experiences in Canada that have been extremely important for the innovation ecosystem that has been built in Canada. And, and from our experiences, it's certainly one of the most uh, leading countries in the world that has actually established uh, clear ecosystems for entrepreneurs to actually flourish. And, and as, as we all know, Canada is a, is a country of multinationals. You know, we, we come from many, many different parts of the world and have established in Canada for generations now. And, and we feel that the government has been very supportive in terms of building this ecosystem that helps the growth and, and wealth creation. So, you know, as a snapshot of, uh, of Canada, Canada has, has taken that, that first step of creating a, a process and, and putting in place systems that allow uh, entrepreneurs and idea researchers to flourish in this industry, whether it's a university uh, research, funded research, or it's a, it's a company that requires innovation. Uh, there are many programs that have been put in place and, and those programs help create that ecosystem and create the success that rides along with it. As a result of this, uh, you know, Canada has in the past seven years uh, actually listed over 13,000 patents and this is only in the U.S. market. This is nothing on, you know, we still have many more thousands that are listed in Canada. But these were established by researchers out of universities and individuals that were filed in the U.S. market. Uh, overall, uh, you know, in Canada, we roughly go through about $30 billion in R&D work on an annual basis, and this is uh, in the last two years. The, the, the government, in terms of uh, to help that system, has put many incentives in place, and they start right from the gr grassroots level. The grassroots levels are apprenticeship programs. Uh, you know, as a new graduate out of a university, as a company, you have the capability of hiring someone as a young graduate and taking advantage of being able to bring them into the workforce and be able to get advantages uh, so that you can hire them, you can train them. And we all know when new, you know, new kids come into the workforce, they have a lot of learning. They have a lot of areas to develop their personal growth and their communication skills and other areas. So the government has been very, very creative in terms of saying we have many ways to reward you as an employer to help you build your business. And in doing so, they have actually put many tax credits in place. Um, and the area that the government has really focused in the last few years has been sustainable technology development in the clean tech area. And that in itself is a billion dollars earmarked for commercialization. And there are currently over 400 technologies that are being funded by the government at the research level, as well as helping them to get to commercialization. <laughs> This makes, you know, in Canada, it makes it actually the least costliest place to conduct R&D activity globally. And it's surprising because, you know, we all hear India is a very uh, good place, and I, I know it is because we have offices here and we do it very efficiently. But there's no doubt even Canada has uh, great efficiency in terms of being able to help innovation. Um, from an R&D perspective, as, as I indicated, uh, the low cost is only derived because of the federal programs that are put in place, and there are tax credits, and there are tax credits specifically designed for various verticals. The, the ecosystem in Canada overall uh, has, only, has only come about because the government took those initiatives, and the private sector took the initiative to actually work with government to indicate what was needed, and then it was a matter of collaboratives that created, build those systems. And, and I've given some examples here, and I'll just cite a few. 
uh, you know, we look at uh, the Canada t Technology Triangle. Now, if we look at the province of Ontario, Ontario spans from Windsor up to, uh, you know, Ottawa, which is the main corridor of technology development. And between that corridor of 400, kilom 400 500 kilometers, we actually have roughly 10,000 companies that are in, in, actively involved in technology, develop, many technology development and many clusters. To make those successful, we have the Canada uh, Technology Triangle that's based out of Waterloo, Waterloo being one of the premier universities in Canada, right down to Invest Ottawa that's based out of Ottawa. And, and in doing so, these, these various clusters actually allow the companies to be able to get the assistance they require. Then, you know, another good example is C100, which is based out of San Francisco. This is for the Valley. This is predominantly for the technology experts. These are all Canadian entrepreneurs who have actually gone to the Valley. They work for the likes of Facebook, Yahoo, all of the prominent companies that we hear of every day. But they get together and they create and help create an ecosystem for newcomers to come in and be able to flourish and get the right leads and contacts that they require. So it actually further enhances the ecosystem. Um, you know, aside Canary Network in Canada, which was established by the government some 25 years ago. And it was really set up to establish a research broadband network which allows, you know, millions of terabytes of data to flow across networks seamlessly between universities, researchers, as well as colleges and corporations. And this is an establishment by the Canadian government and they have continued to evolve that. Um, you know, what, how do you create an innovation hub? It's a very, very important element because over the last seven years in India, I've been witnessing the growth of seed, seed capital and we heard Mr. Sinha talk about that risk capital. It's very, very important in this country for people to step, step up at the early stage to help the Indian entrepreneur flourish in an ecosystem where he or she may not have that privilege or opportunity to build a business. So the, the way it's been done in North America is you create the ecosystem around entrepreneurs. You take successful entrepreneurs, you create mentors out of them, you make them EIRs, or entrepreneurs in residence at various firms. They could be VC firms, they could be government organizations. It's a very important tool that's used collectively. And then you create a cluster model that allows you to create this ecosystem that brings all of these people together and allows them to flourish and help people that need the requirements. One of the areas that Canada has re recently started is they call it a soft landing program, a visa program, that has now been established by the Canadian government to ease transition from global uh, geographies to come to Canada and actually help set up your business, provide you some funding in local environments that actually allow you to grow. And, and to, to us, we feel as, as Canada is a land of multinationals, it, it is a great step by the government. The, the innovation, uh, you know, to create that ecosystem, you go one step further down and, and you talk about CEO forums, sector specific sessions that are held by leaders in the community, whether they're government leaders or they're leaders from the industry. It is really important for these people to communicate, to talk. These type of, of sessions are fantastic to get the expression across from various global areas and to be able to exchange notes, ideas as to what we're doing that works and what's not working. So at the end of it, this all helps facilitate exports, it facilitates partnerships, investment, which is what we all need in any type of innovation. To, to fuel this innovation, it's really important to address what is it that drives it. And in our view, you know, if you take a less attractive vertical, which, uh, you know, when you're, when you're taking a, a, a SWOT across multi-verticals, you say, what do you think is the next leading element that people will require? And this comes from consultations. Once you've decided that you've got that sweet spot of ideas, and it could be wireless, it could be clean tech, it could be uh, defense, military, whichever areas are important to the cluster that's being built in any city, you actually focus on that and create policies that basically make it, the, the barriers are taken away. So that, that establishment of those uh, clusters can flourish, they can succeed. In, uh, I'm going to use Ottawa as an example because Ottawa being the capital of Canada, we've, we've done very well. And, and in this case, we've built many systems and, and the ecosystem is very successful. An example of some of the exits, we've had some very large exits of companies in Canada and this, is, uh, this has been very good for all of us. Um, in order to succeed, you know, there are many steps that entrepreneurs have to take. To, to get there and I've, I've shared 
you know, there are areas of human resources, governance, leadership. They're very, very important qualities in legal and intellectual property. So to finish off, um, you know, the Canadian government has established many trade offices across the world that help uh, bring this expertise back to, to the country and to help entrepreneurs in all social environments to actually be able to bring their ideas to market. Thank you. Thank you. I know we are running short of time. I am to be blamed because I was late, so I can't say much. Yeah. Uh, our next speaker is Dr. Brahmachari, and then we have one more speaker, and then we need to turn over this floor to a friend of mine for the next session. Jeff is almost staring at me, so I don't want to be too late. Okay, please help me. Give me a gift of your time. Dr. Brahmachari. Thanks for uh, asking me to share uh, my experience as the Director General CSIR on scaling up. Uh, just to give you an idea, the CSI India, with a uh, large number of chain of CA national laboratories, where it was built primarily for self-reliance in the beginning post-independence and to build indigenous industry. But as the industry's character changes, it's very difficult to say Tata is an Indian industry or a multinational industry. And when it employs largest number of British people in the United Kingdom. So therefore, the focus is how do we scale up for the people who are in the land of India? I give you two examples, open source truck discovery. Another one is CSIR 800. And I've given you the website example. The principle is how do we use crowdsourcing and open innovation as a process by which we can do the scaling up. And if you go to history of crowdsourcing, you will realize it's only this recent years from Wikipedia onwards, we have recently started using it. The word came in 2006 and actually 2007 CSIR launched this open source drug discovery and today, of course, we have Brain Vita as one of the major initiative, Brain Initiative by Obama. The reason is drug discovery is complex and motivation is an important component to bring people together than scale up. I show this that it was launched in September 2008. It begins slowly, but now today, it is one of the largest movement on the open source initiative for drug discovery. We are taking it up for tuberculosis because every day 1,000 people die on tuberculosis in India and across the world millions of people die. There is no drug for the last 50 years, new drugs. We are still depending on the old drug and multi-drug resistance tuberculosis is becoming a serious problem. OSDD have now has model as a recognized globally by scaling process. It has been talked about, written about, and I just want to show the international bodies have joined. Nesta, in his UK report, also considers open source drug discovery of India as a cost effective, low cost, the most effective initiative in the recent Nesta report, and also scaled up. Just to show you how scale up works, when we started, within one year, we were very slow. Everybody said it's not going to work. Today, we have 7,685 people on that portal. We have 181 principal investigators working on 281 projects across nearly 100 institutions. And all this has happened on the portal. No coaxing, no bringing. And all I can tell, this is the largest initiative where 90 chemists, PI, are with 300, 400 students are synthesizing thousands of molecules to create a library which will be open source library. You can see the network has grown and it grows every day and it is now on an autopilot mode. You can see institutions of all characters are brought in the project has two components. One is the innovation driven, another is process driven. Innovation driven is done by all young people. They are, they are taught to be irreverent 
and the process driven is people who are practiced and disciplined, for example, contract research organization. Today we have uh, several contract research organization which are taking over from the project, from the developmental stage for developmental stage. Early discovery at the laboratory, which then goes with partnership with the scale up. <clears throat> so many international bodies from TB Alliance, MMB, DNDI, Royal Society of Chemistry, and others have joined the initiative. And we look forward that after this meeting, we'll have many more countries to join this initiative. Today, it is from 130 countries people have registered to this site, over nearly 8,000 people. So this is a summary that it takes time, but it builds. The only difficulty is that scaling is slow to begin with and then takes up exponentially. And the normally, we do not have sustaining power, especially the leader. The criticism builds up so much, we give up. If you, so you need a leader who is not going to give up even when he is criticized. And every stage people will ask you what would be the next. If it's your own business, it doesn't matter. But if you're using public money, you're asked too often. The second example is CSIR 800. India has divided into three parts of the world. 800 million people are very poor. 200 million middle class for which the whole world is here. And 50 million are super rich who has 20 stories houses. And therefore, we have very rich lot of people. And the question is, how do we create wealth for the bottom of the pyramid and not look for the business at the bottom of the pyramid? And creating wealth for the bottom of the pyramid, we came up with this program called CSR 800. And the CSR 800 business model is take the money from the top as a philanthropic, use middle class as an entrepreneur, create wealth for the bottom of the pyramid where people benefit. And that benefit will generate wealth for the business and eventually you create $100 billion money available for business, education, wealth and all because you have made them earn $100 per individual. Here is an example. We decided that we should reduce the tuberculosis incidence among the rickshaw pullers in Delhi. How do we convert and make their life easy? We created an electrical rickshaw, solar powered. But all I can tell you, we realize that if we keep it as an IP protected, restricted, it will not proliferate. Therefore, we decided to remove all IP barrier and made it open and asked the crowdsourcing of the rickshaw puller and the designers and anybody to modify. The consequence is today on the city of Delhi, across the country, there is Everywhere, now this is getting proliferated. But it was not so in the beginning. So the man is saying here that he doesn't have to go to doctor anymore. Otherwise, he has to go to doctor. And you can just to give an idea that 80,000 rickshaw in the city of Delhi, 20,000 people at the end of fourth year get tuberculosis. And they transmit 100,000 people tuberculosis. So here is a known connected to health effort in a how circuitous way you really do the health care. And the scaling up is by the people. So all sorts of model is on the red. Here is another example, how to give rural India. Again, it's an open source, non-exclusive licensing, very no national, no agreement signed. And this has proliferated in thousands and hundreds of hectares and created economic complete transformation from rice, paddy, cultivation to all sorts of uh, cost effective nutrition. I show this last example that here is an industry which was non existent. We had a small industry of a few hundred crores. It was Gujarat tiles. We had to import 20% of the soil of the Spartex tiles were imported from Ukraine. The inventory cost was very high. So they came to CSIR asking for, can we find an alternative soil? So the soil property was identified. And here is an example. We gave technology to 10 licensing, but because of the cluster, 64 industry got, took it over. And now today we can't count, maybe 500 industries manufacturing and to Gujarat tiles has become a 3,000 crore enterprise 
from from a 50 100 crore enterprise and the price fell and the volume increased hundreds of millions of square feet here is an example the scaling has taken place and the scaling has taken place because of clustering effect because of non exclusive licensing barrier because of non involvement of legal framework uh, one of the most important component is Again, scaling up, we have come up with this new idea of using IT, telemedicine, and creating in a container. You have to understand the policy. You cannot build a house in a rural land because you this agricultural land, you cannot build a concrete building. So we have a container, which we are surplus with, because these containers are imported from mostly Chinese product come. And you can see this container, we are converted with HP into a, a IT enabled mobile house just as the other side to create wealth and business model we have created this organization called CSI Tech Private Limited with uh, Saurav Sivastava is in our board and Vijay Kelke is the chairman Mohandas Pai and this is where the State Bank of India has come up and taken a 10 percent stake giving a high valuation reasonable valuation for this organization and this is what I believe in next 10 years will create transform entrepreneurship and all the processes. Thank you. Thank you, Dr. Brahmachari.